All right. We will now call our um, budget sub committee six to order. Would you call the roll? Skinner. I'm here. Bloom. Here. Chavez. Here. Daly. Here. Gorel. Here. Harkey. Joan Sawyer. Murasuchi. Weber. Um, morning. So the purpose of this particular subcommittee is an informational hearing on the progress or process so far of the dissolution of redevelopment. And I'm sure uh, most of you who are here have been following this, but in 2012, when the legislature passed AB 1484, the intent was to clarify the dissolution process so that we could have hopefully a smooth process for the unwinding of redevelopment. Um, and we also wanted to uh, try to, well, nobody, uh, well, we were trying to anticipate what the, um, what some of the roadblocks might be or hangups might be so that we might uh, face a less litigious situation and that uh, there was a process for um, the cities to, if they were uh, questioning a ruling of Department of Finance, that there would be a process for that. Um, and because of our intent, the administration asked in that bill that the legislature put very tight timelines in order to uh, not only have a smooth process, but also to speed it up because the intent for, um, for dissolving redevelopment was in order to free up those uh, tax increments that were otherwise encumbered so that they could be free for schools and the other purposes. Um, so as the time since, we I think are all aware that there's been, um, that it's not gone quite as smoothly, that there are still a great deal of um, court proceedings around the question. Uh, so I think what we want to do today is to try to air some of that and to see what, if anything, we might do to help, uh, again, put it back on track and make the process smoother. Um, so let me see if any members want to make any opening remarks before we have our uh, panel come and speak. Ah, Ms. Um, Atkins. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. I just wanted, uh, for the record, to thank you for uh, letting me join you today. I am, of course, not a member of this uh, subcommittee, but as uh, chair of the Redevelopment Working Group appointed by the Speaker, have been working on this. So I appreciate the opportunity, and thank you for letting me uh, participate today. Absolutely. Um, Ms. Harkey, we just made open remarks, and we invited any uh, members to uh, join any comment before we started the panel if you wanted to make any opening remarks. Thank you. This is always an area of my concern. I'm very, very concerned with funding for local government and all the realignment that's taking place, as well as the RDAs. Um, my district in particular is not really hit hard by any of this. Unfortunately, the county and the state is. So I'll be looking forward to see what we can do. Thank you. All right, so let's open with our first panel, and we have Justin Howard, who's the Assistant Program Manager from the Department of Finance, and Walter Barnes from the State Controller's Office. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, it's been about a, a year since I think we were last here kind of updating you on the dissolution of the redevelopment agencies. Um, and, you know, we've, we've, we've done a lot since then. There should be a handout that I hope all of you have. It, it should be look like this. I want to walk through a few of the slides. Hopefully everyone has a copy. Um, and, you know, I won't go into a lot of detail on the first couple slides. I think the staff report does a pretty good job laying out, you know, the history about, you know, why, you know, how did we get here and why we dissolved redevelopment agencies in the first place. But just to reemphasize for everyone out there, at the time when redevelopment was, was going, it was redirecting about $5 billion in property tax from schools, cities, counties, and special districts for use, um, basically with very little oversight um, at the local level. Um, at the time, 
the state was facing a multi-billion dollar budget deficit as well. And any amounts that were being redirected from schools was basically being backfilled by the state general fund via our Prop 98 requirements. Um, the policy decision was made to eliminate redevelopment agencies in order to protect core public services such as police, fire, and other and other um, services at the local level. Um, so that was the that was the overarching goal. And to date, I think we've accomplished that task. How did we get here? On the next page, um, really, there's the key legislation and events that happened was the, the passage of ABX 126 and ABX 127. Just to remind the members, ABX 126 dissolved redevelopment agencies, while ABX 127 authorized an alternative program. Um, CRA, the California Redevelopment Association, sued um, over those bills. Um, it was went, the case went directly to the state supreme court. Uh, the state supreme court at that time upheld ABX 126 dissolving the redevelopment agencies, and they struck down ABX 127. And that's kind of where we are today. Um, as a result of them striking that down, um, the legislature, as the chair pointed out, passed AB 1484, which put into place further clarification and processes to help provide an orderly uh, wind down and an efficient and um, expeditious wind down of the former redevelopment agencies. Um, also recently, another bill was signed by the governor just recently, um, AB 471, that added some further clarifications to various areas in the law. Um, so what does dissolution involve? Believe it or not, this is a very complex process. We're talking about agencies in many cases that have been around for decades that we are unwinding. So it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. Um, there are three primary entities who are responsible um, associated with the dissolution of their redevelopment agencies. Obviously, you have the Department of Finance. You also have the State Controller's Office, but you also have the County Auditor Controllers. Those are the three main cogs, I would say, who are responsible for overseeing the entire wind down of redevelopment agencies. Um, finance has several responsibilities in the statutes, everything from reviewing obligations that need to get paid, including uh, reviewing, uh, doing what are called due diligence reviews, and those are, which are audits of the cash assets of the former redevelopment agencies. Finance also reviews the housing asset transfers that occurred. Uh, we, re we issue finding of completions once certain benchmarks have been met in statute. We also review the property plans that are ultimately put together by the agencies towards the end of their, um, it, towards the end of their uh, process. Um, and I won't go into the other the other components for the controller's office and the county auditor controllers, but they are listed here at a very high level to give you a sense of some of the things that they do as well. You know, overall, when we look at what the goals and objectives are, uh, finance for finance, as we delved into this process, um, we really got organized back in July of 2012. Um, that, that beginning first six-month period, once the agencies were officially dissolved, was pretty chaotic for us, and it took us a while to kind of get um, our feet underneath us, get staffed up, and get ready to go. Um, you know, our, our goal is to oversee the expeditious winding down of the state's former redevelopment agencies. And within that context, some of our primary goals are to protect bondholders, to make sure that they get paid on their debts, to protect core public services by ensuring that property taxes being returned to the local agencies so that they can spend them on the manner which they see fit. Um, and then we try to minimize litigation w when possible. And, uh, and I'll delve into the litigation aspect more towards the end of my presentation, but it's really not as much as one may think. Um, we, we strive to develop positive working, productive and positive working relationships with the counties, cities, and special districts. You know, besides the meet and confer process that was in place, we, we, we've also instituted a meet and discuss process where agencies can come and meet with us to talk about all sorts of um, issues that they perceive um, having you know, being in front of them. Um, and then as we go through this, we try to become an expert in redevelopment agency operations and finances, which helps improve our communication and our review with local governments as we go through this process. So to date, to update you, what are the fiscal results from dissolution? Um, I'm pleased to tell you that, you know, in the first two years, 2011-12 and 2012-13, We've returned over $875 million to counties, $620 million to cities, $310 million to special districts. It is estimated within the current year and the budget year that another $605 million is going to counties, $525 million to cities, and $205 million to special districts. On an ongoing basis, once we set aside all the one-time reviews and one-time cash that these entities are receiving, there's going to be over $700 million annually divvied up amongst these entities going back to them. This is general purpose revenue that they can spend on whatever they want at the local level. 
police, fire, economic development, whatever their councils or governing bodies deem appropriate. As for the state fiscal impact that has happened, um, we generally get an offset based on whatever went to schools. So in the first two years, in 11, 12, and 12, 13, 2.2 billion was returned to schools. It is estimated in 13, 14, and 14, 15 that another 1.1 billion will be returned to schools. And then on an ongoing basis, and this will grow each year, um, it's estimated that $1 billion will be going to schools. Um, keep in mind that over the long term, that will ultimately grow once all the debt's paid off to that $5 billion number, which was annually being redirected. The next slide kind of gives you a, a graphical example of how much money is going back to the taxing entities. The blue box represents the amount going to schools, county offices of education, and ERAF. Red represents the amounts that were going to cities, counties, and special districts. Um, you'll see the large numbers in the early years. A lot of there, there's a, this is the, just the ongoing amount, though. The, the difference between 11 and 12 and 12, 13 is because much of the 11, 12 money was pushed into 12, 13 as we just started the process. But you'll notice from 14, 15, on, there's a steady growth, and that's because as the obligations get paid down and property taxes grow, the gulf between those two divergent lines gets bigger, and that's how much more money is going to local governments. So we've accomplished a lot over in the last year and a half. Um, so what has been accomplished to date? I can tell you that when we started, we started with 401 successor agencies. Those are the agencies that have taken over for redevelopment agencies. Um, they are charged with the winding down of the affairs at the local level. Currently, there are only 385 active agencies. 16 agencies have been completely dissolved. We've also been notified by an additional four agencies who are ready to dissolve this year. What does that mean when they're ready to dissolve? That means they've paid off all their bills and they've disposed of all their assets. So that's good news. That's where we want to go. We want to get agencies to the point where they're ready to dissolve. One of the things that was responsible for early on was the July true-up payments. Um, to date, all, the, all agencies have completed the July true-up process except for four. Those four um, have to do because those cities are in bankruptcy or they have other audit issues that they're still trying to work through. But that, that's a tremendous amount of um, work that has been done related to the July true-up process. Housing asset transfers. The bill required um, entities to either elect to become the housing successor entity for the former RDA, or if they did not elect so, it kind of fell onto the county to assume those responsibilities from the former redevelopment agency. Um, the law required all the housing assets to transfer to those entities. Finance was able to review those assets and make recommendations or make determinations on whether or not the assets being transferred met the definition of a housing asset as defined in statute. What I'm pleased to tell you is that all the housing asset transfers have been completed. Um, you know, while we still every now and then have a housing asset that we come across, the agency quickly transfers that pursuant to the statute, and there is no and there is no issue. So finance is done with the housing asset transfer review process. What else has been accomplished? The due diligence reviews. Again, these are the cash audits of the unencumbered balances of the former redevelopment agencies. There are two specific due diligence reviews that were required to be done. You have the low and moderate income housing asset fund due diligence review, or the just the low and moderate income housing fund, and then you had the all other funds and accounts. I'm pleased to tell you that we've comp of all the active agencies, we've completed all the DDRs for every agency except for 11. Those 11 agencies just have not submitted all their DDRs to finance yet, which is why they haven't been completed. Um, so, so that's good. That's, that's far, from finance perspective, we've completed everything we can. We're waiting on those last 11 to submit their um, DDRs, their due diligence reviews to us for review. And once they do that, we'll quickly work through those as well. Um, final and conclusive reviews. Final and conclusive reviews are really related to enforceable obligations, and it's some of the, you may have heard some concerns about whether or not finance um, approves something on one ROPS period and then denies it on a, a next ROPS period. Um, well, the fact of the matter is there's many items that get listed on a recognized obligation payment schedule that we don't review. And so when we finally get around to reviewing it, it then will either get approved or denied on a subsequent period, and it may seem as though it was previously approved when it wasn't. Well, there is a process to stop our ability to review whether or not something's an enforceable obligation in the future, and it's called final and conclusive. Agencies can submit a request to finance asking us to deem a particular obligation final and conclusive. If we agree, we will no longer object to that being placed for payment. We will only review it to make sure the amount requested is accurate. 
Unfortunately, not a lot of agencies take advantage of this. I'm not sure why. We've only received 40 requests to date. We've approved 25, and we still have about another 13 to 14 under review. Oversight board actions. Finance regularly reviews oversight board actions to make sure they're being done in accordance with the statutes. We've reviewed approximately 1,500 to date. On the next page, what else has been accomplished? The recognized obligation payment schedules. This is really the, what I call the meat and potatoes of the work that we're doing. It's a biannual process where agencies submit to us the, basically the bills that they think they need to pay in the upcoming period. Um, we review those to see whether or not they meet the definitions of enforceable obligation. If they do, we approve them. If they don't, we object to them. Um, we've completed five cycles to date. We are just beginning our sixth cycle this upcoming March. Um, we, we, have, we hold meet and confers with any agency that disagrees with our determinations. As you can see, we've held 550 meet and confers in total throughout all the various processes related to um, the recognized obligation payment schedules. Um, then the next thing on the list is finding of completions. And what is a finding of completions? It really is a pretty big benchmark for agencies. It kind of delineates that you've completed all the cash asset um, reviews. Um, you, you've reached a, a, basically a milestone that says you're far enough along to where you get to where certain benefits are now triggered in your favor, such as getting repaid on city loan RDA payments, spending stranded bond proceeds that were issued prior to 2011. What I'm pleased to announce is of the 385 active agencies, 302 have a finding of completion. That is a huge number and it's very significant. Um, I, I list the reasons here for why the other ones don't have a finding of completion yet. Um, the DDR process is the really the primary um, holdup for those agencies. It's either because they haven't paid the amounts that was required or they haven't completed the process. One of the things that agencies are required to do once they get a finding of completion is submit what's called a long-range property management plan to the Department of Finance. And this property management plan will specify the disposition of all the real property assets as well as interest in real property um, of the former redevelopment agency. I can tell you to date we have received 230 plans. Um, as of as of this week, we've, we've now completed up to 65 approvals. We are making substantial progress in this area. Um, this is one of our highest priorities as we do have a deadline. The deadline is the end of this calendar year for us to um, complete the reviews of those plans that get submitted to us. One question I get a lot is whether or not we think agencies are really winding down. Well, I can tell you I think they are winding down. When you look at the next graph, it really, this, this is showing you um, requested obligations versus approved obligations listed on a ROPS over the various periods. This shows you the, the decline in, in enforceable obligations being listed because one, they're being paid off. Or two, we are cleaning up those that are truly obligations of the agencies. Um, you'll see a small uptick in the last two years. That's only because those agencies that have now received a finding of completion actually list their stranded bond proceeds as an enforceable obligation on the ROPS. So that caused a slight uptick. In fact, there was about $4 billion in pre-2011 bonds that are now being listed and expended statewide. The next slide really shows you the total outstanding debt of these agencies. So when we began this process, when we had our first submittal of what was the outstanding obligations of the agencies, it was over $110 billion that was listed as being owed out there. Um, over the, through reviewing obligations, through paying those bills, we are now down to roughly $60 billion in debt that is owed by the successor agencies on a statewide basis. Of that amount, if you look at the blue line, believe it or not, it is slightly declining. That is really your debt service payments that are owed. Those are going to be paid off over a long period of time, whether it's 20 to 30 years. Um, so many of these agencies are going to be in existence for a while as we pay off their debt. Um, but the red line is really the more discretionary Eh, discretionary is probably not the right word, I apologize, but those are really the other enforceable obligations that aren't tied to debt service payments. The next slide really is meant to show you that while we've instituted this ROPS process and we've instituted a meet and confer process to handle um, issues surrounding our determinations, that that process is improving. And, you know, the 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 
the disagreements over our decisions are declining and declining substantially. You'll look when we had our first meet and confer session, which was ROPS 3, we had over 62% of all the agencies at that time actually request a meet and confer. The last ROPS period, we were down to 138. We are projecting this upcoming period probably to be around 68. I know the question is going to be, well, why do you still expect 68? Well, we still have entities that list obligations that have been denied on a ROPS from previous periods, primarily because they are reserving their rights as they go through court to uh, basically what they tell us is they want to exhaust the administrative, administrative process each time um, before um, the court ultimately rules on their issue. So they continue to list them even though we don't believe they're enforceable obligations. So they come in, they meet. In, in some cases, we've met on the same issue three or four times already with these agencies, but we keep coming to the same conclusion because legally speaking, we don't believe they're enforceable obligations. So we do expect to have some of those disagreements. And then in, just in general, we always have one, you know, a, a handful that where there may be an error or something that we didn't get that causes a need to have a meet and confer. So the next slide really gets to what do we think still needs to be done? You know, our goal, as clearly stated by the chair, was we're here to expeditiously wind down these agencies. I know the locals don't want us in their, in their business any longer <laughs> than we, we really want to be in their business. We want to try to wind them down as soon as possible. Um, so what needs to continue? Well, unfortunately, we still have to complete the review of all the items that have been listed on a recognized obligation payment schedule. Believe it or not, that has not happened yet. We only do a sampling on everybody's ROPs each period. Unfortunately, we still have new items that continue to get listed. We still have some agencies, for whatever reason, who don't list all their obligations until such a time as they think a payment is due so that we don't know what the, uni the complete universe is. While we've provided you in that other slide what we think it is, that's only based on what we know. So while agencies continue to add items, those are things that we're going to have to continue to review. Other things we need to continue to do in the future is to ensure that the amount requested ties to the actual obligation. What does that mean? Well, that means like if, if your contract calls for a million dollars to be paid by the RDA, that that's what you're requesting. You're not requesting 10 million. Many of these agreements have multiple funding sources from multiple entities, and, we all, and we're only responsible for making sure that the former redevelopment agency pays its correct share. Um, we still need to recon rec reconcile all the fund balances. The fund balances, there's been a lot of movement of cash, as you, as you may suspect, um, in that early 2011, 2012 period. And when I say reconcile the fund between the state controller's office and between the Department of Finance, there's been a lot of determinations that ordering things to be undone and unwound, various transactions. So we need to make sure that the successor agency's balance are at the correct um, beginning numbers. Um, what else do we do? We need to ensure that other funds are being used to pay obligations before the former the, before the previous tax commitment is being requested. What does that mean? Many agencies get lease revenues, rents, they have other receivables. Under the law, they are required to spend that money first before asking for a property tax allocation to pay their bills. Um, I'll give you an example. This last period, we only we, we reclassified over $75 million in obligations to other funding sources from property tax because they had available balances that they were supposed to use, but they didn't actually request. And that only is for a small handful of the agencies out there. That doesn't even take into account the complete reconciliation of the fund balances for the agencies yet. So there's still a lot of work to be done there. And then we still need to complete internally our automation process. We've been working towards a complete automated ROPS process to make it easier on all the, pro on all the parties at the local level. Right now, agencies can log into a database system and download their forms and upload their forms so they no longer have to email them. It's all automated for them. We still need some work on, on internally on our side to improve that automation process to make the, the review part of it even quicker. And then obviously, on an ongoing basis, we still have to work on the property plans. Those are our number one priorities. Um, final and conclusive reviews and those OB actions will continue. When do we think dissolution will end? Well, in a nutshell, the dissolution of RDAs does not technically end until such a time as all the debts have been paid and all their assets have been disposed of. Um, and that can happen and for some entities that's going to be many, many years. We have agencies out there that have long-term enforceable obligations, meaning they have DDAs that are going to go on for a decade or more. Um, they have debt service that are extended out for 30 years. And in many cases, city RDA loans are only now being repaid according to the formula and statute, and that'll take many years for them to get repaid. Does that mean that improvements can't be made? No. 
we, we do think that beginning in 2016, there is a, there's an opportunity to make improvements to the process. In fact, once we get to 2015, we'd like to begin a, a, some talks, some stakeholder group talks. We would like to work with the um, assembly working group on this topic and talk about streamlining the ROPS process for those agencies that have gotten down to the point that the only thing that is left is really your debt service. Um, maybe we can go to a single ROPS a year versus biannual ROPS. But we're not ready yet. We need to get to, the, to, to 2015 to talk about that. And then we think the key date, which is in statute, is 2016, which is when all the oversight boards currently go away and there's one oversight board that's formed for each county. And so that'll streamline the process quite a bit. So I think what's on a lot of people's mind is what is the status of litigation? Um, have there been a lot of lawsuits? Yes, there have been a lot of lawsuits. But in the context of things, it's not as much as you may think. Um, there are, since the beginning of this process, there have been 181 lawsuits filed. I can tell you that of those lawsuits that have been filed, 82 have been, have, been, uh, have been completed with rulings in favor of the state. We have this, there has been five that have been completed with rulings in partial favor of the state. Only six rulings have gone against the state to date. So at, we've only had 90 three total lawsuits being resolved, and 87 have been ruled in favor of the state. There are 49 active cases, and by active cases, I mean they have currently have a hearing date set some point in the future. And there are another 39 cases that are out there where there's what we can, what I call inactive at this point, because no hearing date's been set for whatever reason. Many agencies have filed lawsuits, but they have chosen not to set a hearing date. I'd have to defer to them for why that is. I suspect many of them don't have strong cases. Um, <laughs> and so they're waiting to see how other things go. But we have been very successful in court to date. And I know that is the last stop for many agencies, is court. Um, some of the key cases that I do want to highlight, though, and which represent some of the ones that have um, rulings against the state. So we have a case re surrounding the sales and use tax withhold provisions that was added as part of AB 1484. This is basically a remedy that was provided to finance for those agencies who didn't pay their due diligence review amounts, where we could order the Board of Equalization to withhold the sales and use tax if the money that was transferred was at the city. Um, there have been two cases. You have the Bellflower case and the League of California Cities case. Um, the Bellflower case ruled the sales and use tax was constitutional. The League case, the judge ruled um, sales and use tax withhold was unconstitutional. So we have two different judges with two opposite decisions. Um, both sides are appealing those cases to the appellate court. That's where that's going to have to get resolved. In the meantime, um, finance is not utilizing that remedy at this time, pending outcome of, those, uh, of that case. The other case, which kind of popped up more recently, primarily in uh, December of last year, was related to Proposition 22. And there are two cases in front of a particular judge um, called the Brentwood case and the Foster City case. Now, I want to stress that these are only tentative decisions in front of this judge. This judge did request supplemental briefing. All parties filed those supplemental briefings. But basically what this case, um, what the judge ruled in this case was that the, deed, that the due diligence review clawback where we ordered the return of cash that was transferred in 2011, as applied to these cases, violates Proposition 22, which prohibits um, taking money from uh, the redevelopment agencies. Um, so therefore, he, de he declared it unconstitutional in those cases. Um, we have two other cases where the judges already ruled that Prop Proposition 22 doesn't apply. The state also believes that this issue was already resolved by the Supreme Court in the broader ABX 126 um, lawsuit in general. So we're very confident on appeal that we're going to win. However, you know, that doesn't mean that there still aren't risks associated with that. Um, I did want to point out that there are 16 cases currently on appeal out of all those 82 that have been resolved. Um, finally, so what's the impact of litigation? What controls? Well, really, superior court cases aren't precedential. So the determination in one, one case does not impact determinations in another case. Only a ruling at the appellate level would, would be precedential for everyone to follow. Um, again, we're not pursuing the sales and use tax at this time because of the, the divergent rulings in the two cases. And there is a fiscal risk associated with the Proposition 22 ruling. Depending on the scope of that ruling and how broadly the judge rules, there could be, there, there could be a substantial fiscal impact to whether or not amounts related to that due diligence review process actually get paid or not. 
Um, we've calculated that assets transferred between January 1 of 2011 and February 12 of 2012, when the agencies were officially dissolved by the Supreme Court, totaled about $3.4 billion. So depending on the scope of when that is, the, the fiscal impact can run anywhere in between there. And then I want to point out that while 181 lawsuits may seem like a lot, it really isn't in the grand scheme of things. If you take a step back and you actually look at all the determinations that we have made and all the reviews that have been completed, we've completed over 15,000 individual reviews and actions directing things to be changed and according with the dissolution statutes. Litigation represents only approximately 1% of all the decisions that have been made out there. And it's, that is not a lot in the grand scheme of things. So with that, that's really the end of my presentation. I do want to just take a minute to publicly thank the staff of the Department of Finance for all the work that they've done over the last year and a half. It hasn't been a, it's, it's been a, a lot of work over a short amount of time. Staff have worked long hours in order just to get to where we are. Um, I think we've accomplished a lot. While things haven't gone as smoothly as many may like, we think they've, prog they've progressed in a satisfactory manner, and um, we are happy with where we're currently at in the process. So with that, I don't know, I would turn it over to Walter to see if he has any comments to make, and then I'd be happy to answer any questions. We're going to hold off questions till we hear from the controller's office. Sure.